Good morning, Liberty University. Will you bow your heads and pray with me real quick? Uh, dear Lord, thanks so much, God, for this day. We come to you uh, in awe, Lord Jesus, and we just are so grateful for all that you do for us and all that you've done for us, God. Thank you so much for waking us up this morning and just giving us another day on this earth. Uh, every second, every day is a gift, and we do not take that for granted. Uh, I just want to pray for all the people who are here for CIFA. God, I pray that you give them clarity. I pray that you uh, make yourself known to them, Lord Jesus. I pray that they have an amazing time, and I pray that they can, like I said, just hear from you, Lord Jesus. I also want to stop uh, and pray for all those people affected in a Thousand Oaks, God, with the, with the horrible shooting. Um, I just want to pray that you put your angels around them, God. I pray that, that they feel your presence, that you grieve with them, Lord Jesus, that they can feel your arms wrapping around them, that they feel your love, God. I, uh, I pray for today's convocation. I pray that you speak uh, through our wonderful speaker, Lord Jesus, and I pray that we hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. My name is Austin, and I'm a junior here at Liberty University, and uh, it, is, <laughs> it is my honor and my privilege to be able to introduce today's convocation speaker. She is a number one New York Times bestselling author. She has over 25 million books in print. She is an adjunct professor here at Liberty University, and her brand new book, you just saw the trailer for, is called When We Were Young, and it is amazing, and so go check that out. Uh, but more importantly, more than that, uh, she is a godly woman. She is an amazing wife. She is a wonderful mom to me and my siblings. And I just feel so blessed every single day to be able to call her mom. And um, it, it is so cool to watch how she has stayed the same throughout her whole career and how she is just the most genuine person you will ever meet. And I know that she is going to have uh, an amazing, amazing talk for you guys today. Uh, we are doing, not we, but she is doing a book signing tomorrow at 2 p.m. at the bookstore. So come by, meet her. I'll also be there, so meet me if you would like. Uh, we'll be signing books, and uh, yeah, come by and meet us. But without further ado, give a warm welcome to Karen Kingsbury, my mom. Good job. Well, hello, Liberty! This is so great. I love being here. Welcome to all of you who are here for CIFA. And today we're just going to share a few stories and lean in a little closer to Jesus. So sometimes when I'm writing, I find myself so caught up in the characters, and people say to me, what is that like, spending so much time with people who don't technically exist? And then I tell them about a moment when I was writing the final pages of a character named Ervil. She had kind of become like a grandmother to me, and I was sitting in my chair in my bedroom with my laptop, and I found myself writing more and more slowly because I knew that it was time for Ervil to go to heaven. And I was so sad, even though I knew she'd be better off there, I just was sad about losing her. So I wrote the last words, she took her final breath, and then I had to just take my laptop and set it down beside my chair and have a good cry over losing Ervil. You know, how it is. <laughs> and that's where I was when my husband came bounding into the room to get a sweatshirt. He was outside playing ball with the boys, and he saw me crying, just weeping. And he stopped and he said, Karen, oh no, what's wrong? What happened? <laughs> Herbal died. <laughs> well, he got this concerned look and kind of his face went pale, the blood drained, and he said, oh no. Do we know Herbal from church or from school? <laughs> I said, She's one of my characters. <laughs> well, he rolled his eyes all the way to the ceiling. And he said, I don't feel sorry for you. I mean, you killed her. <laughs> I love the way God is using the power of story. I always say when Jesus wanted to tell you straight, he just told you straight. When he wanted to make a point, he turned over a table. But when he wanted to touch your heart, he told a story. 
and I feel so privileged to do that. But I will say, at the end of the day when my family and friends are gathered around at my memorial service, I don't want them to talk about how many books were sold. I don't want to hear anything about the New York Times. All I want them to say is, Mom, she wrote a bestseller with the days of her life. And that's the story that you are here, Liberty students and CFAW students and parents, that's the story that you want to write. A bestseller with the days of your life. Now, along the way, as I've been working on that story, which has a finite number of pages and chapters, God has pressed on my heart some things that just kind of work to make it more of a bestseller, and I think they would work for you too. The first thing is to love well. Now, I know we talk about love a lot, and we can throw that word around, you know, we can say, I love pizza, or sure do love Fridays. But I'm talking about a difficult, all-in kind of love. So in the story that you are writing with the days of your life, some of the characters are a little harder to love, right? And that was true with my story. When I was growing up, my brother David was just so hard to love. He was always yelling, he was always fighting with my parents. When he wanted to make a point, sometimes he would take a dish out of the cupboard and throw it against the wall. I was actually afraid of him much of my life. But as I became a believer in my early 20s and as my relationship with Christ grew, I prayed for David. I prayed and I prayed that God would get his attention and I would give Dave a Bible or I would give him a CD. And he just didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Well, one day I got a phone call in my office and the caller ID said that it was him. And by that point, Dave would only call when he needed something, gas money, that kind of thing. Well, Dave called and I answered the phone. I didn't even want to pick it up. I could hear God say, you never stop loving, never. So I answered the phone and in the background, blaring through my brother's apartment was the song I can only imagine. And my brother says, Karen, you aren't going to believe it. It's like, I finally get it about Jesus. And I want to dance before Jesus one day and I want to be in heaven with him. I can only imagine what that would be like. And hey, can I go to church with you this Sunday? So of course I had to check caller ID. <laughs> yes, Dave, come, we would love for you to come. So he came and I remember my brother, you know, six foot five, big guy, kind of like my son, Austin. And he could say more with a hug than I could say with 100,000 words. So I remember coming into church that week and Dave stepped out in the aisle. He was up front, he had his hands raised. I mean, this is a total transformation. And I walked up to him. People were already standing, so kind of just discreetly came up and he gave me the biggest hug and he said, Karen, thank you for never giving up on me. You want to write a bestseller with the days of your life, love well. Read 1 John 4. Read the whole chapter. We love because he loved us first. Don't give up on the hard characters in your life. The second thing that will make your story a bestseller, laugh often. Like, okay, life is just too serious. I mean, people get offended so easily and, and it's just a difficult time. I think sometimes we're even afraid to crack a smile. That might offend someone. Well, this was when we learned the lesson in our family that, hey, we're going to laugh about it later, so we might as well laugh about it now. And we learned that lesson one spring break when we took a trip to SeaWorld. Now this was before we adopted our boys from Haiti. So we had Kelsey, and she was eight, Tyler was five, and Austin was one. 
And we were going to take this trip, and I'm a planner, so I wanted to be ready. And I went to the camping store, and I bought a backpack rated for 40 days in the wilderness, a huge backpack for one day at SeaWorld. And in that backpack, I stuffed five coats in case we got cold, sunscreen if it got too hot, an umbrella in case it started to rain. I had apples if we needed a healthy snack, bottles of water if we got thirsty, and a first aid kit. Why would you bring so many things to SeaWorld? But it was important to me, and I was ready. We got to the parking lot, we climb out, Austin, it's just one years old, so he's in the little front pack that my husband's got him. It's got the metal bars and the contraption around the waist and Austin's legs kind of off to the side, and he's looking out forward. I've got the backpack, and then we take the kids by the hands, and we look like nomads from a lost land with all of our worldly belongings. We make our way to the gate, and they give us a schedule. And me, a firstborn, I love a schedule. And I looked at that schedule, and I said, sea lion show, 10 minutes, that's us. So we walk through the gates, and there to the side are swings and a slide, like you can get for free in your own neighborhood. And the children say, we must swing. And my husband, who is sometimes the oldest of the children, <laughs> says, we have time to swing. So we go to the swings. The children are having a wonderful time. And I am looking at my watch, and I'm keeping a count. And I say, OK, so eight minutes to the sea lion show, and seven minutes to the sea lion show. And finally, I just say, that's it. We have had enough fun. We must go. So now the children have alarmed looks on their faces. There's more people, so we're pulling them this way, and then this way we're darting through the crowd, and we get around the park to the Sea Lion Stadium, and there is an ice cream stand. And my husband and children are in line before we can say anything. About that time, the music started for the Sea Lion Show, and I knew it was about to begin. Well, working behind the counter that day at the ice cream stand were two teens from Stepford on low battery because it took two of them to hold a cone up to the soft serve ice cream and pull the lever, and the ice cream would go around and around the edge of the cone, but never in the cone, and it would get so high, and then it would just fall to the ground, and they would look at it <laughs> like it was going to jump up and get back in the cone. So we finally have our cones, and we begin to run now toward the steps to get to the Sea Lion Stadium. My cone that I'm holding for Austin falls mid-stride and settles into my shoe between my toes. I ran back and got a bowl for him. And now we're finally at the top of the stadium, and the Sea Lions are already on the stage. The whole place is packed. There's just one row open, and it's about three-fourths of the way down, and I say, that's us. Let's go. Now remember, I've got the giant backpack on my back. And I remember thinking, hmm, these stairs are very steep. Like you almost needed a lead rope to get down the stairs. And I found out later how they do that. A regular step, a half step. Regular, half step. Well, I got my regular foot on the regular step, and then I hit nothing but air. <laughs> and I begin to roll and tumble down the steps. And at first, people thought I was part of the act. <laughs> I know, because I saw them. Video cameras swinging my way. 
About that time, rolling, still tumbling, I realized my backpack was unzipped. <laughs> because things are preceding me down the stairs. Water bottle, a sweater, an umbrella, the first aid kit that we would need later, as it turned out. <laughs> rolling, tumbling. Now, the crowd begins to realize I'm not part of the show. You see them go from... <laughs> and they begin to stick out arms, legs, and I'm just still rolling and tumbling. The ice cream is still between my toes. <laughs> and I finally come to a stop. And I am right at my row. <laughs> so I stood up and I brushed myself off. I waved off the crowd. And then I looked back to where my husband was still at the top of the stairs. An indescribable look on his face. <laughs> I just said, <laughs> to which he released the children to gather our belongings, and we all sat down. And I, I don't remember anything about the Sea Lion Show, <laughs> but except halfway through it, Austin was eating his ice cream from the bowl, his chocolate ice cream, when he sneezed. <laughs> and if you were the woman in front of me with the white shirt, I apologize because I didn't say a thing. Just... Over, I turned to my husband, who really, to his eternal credit, <laughs> up until that time, had not cracked a smile, just eyes on the sea lions, just... <laughs> People are filing out now, and I said, so, you know, how did that look? Just <laughs> rolling and backpack, how did that look? And he began to laugh. No, y'all, he started to cry. <laughs> he couldn't breathe. He slithered to the ground. <laughs> and when he could finally speak, he said, Every woman's dream. <laughs> Hope that your husband tells you you look like a sea turtle at least once in your life. Proverbs 17. This laughter is good medicine. Good, good medicine from God. So laugh. Lighten up. Laugh about it. Now, I did ask them to put this here so I wouldn't fall off the stage. I mean, I don't want to do it again. <laughs> but we laugh often. Love well. Laugh often. Look for the miraculous. The third thing that will mark your story as a bestseller with the finite number of pages and chapters that you have from God, <clears throat> look for the miraculous. There is so much more to life than the deadlines and assignments and bills, than just getting up and just clocking the hours, going back to bed and starting all over again on Monday. God has given us an adventure and faith, and we have the choice to have the eyes to see it. My dad was easily my biggest fan. I mean, my mom loved my books. She would help correct the spelling. But my dad, when I was 13, 14, he would say, Karen, one day everyone is going to know your writing. It's so strong. And you know, Karen, 
Someone has to be the next best-selling author. I think it's going to be you. My dad. I was in Atlanta when I got the phone call. I was at a book conference that my dad had suffered a massive heart attack. 2007. And I really just had one prayer, that he would live long enough for me to come home and say goodbye. Back at home, my mom was in the house with my dad when the heart attack literally took him from wide awake to completely out. And my nephew, Andrew, was home. He was only 12. He said, Graham, I, th I think something's really wrong with Papa. And so he called 911, and the operator walked him through giving my dad CPR in a lazy boy chair for 19 minutes until paramedics came. Well, when they got there, my dad was blue, non-responsive, not breathing, no heartbeat. Andrew ran into the next room, and he just began to sob because he thought it was his fault, and Papa was going to die because of him. So paramedics are working, and they're working frantically on my dad. They're trying to get life, but they're getting ready to call the time of death when a police officer runs into the house. And he runs up to my mom, and he takes hold of her hands where she's standing about 10 feet away from my dad. He says, ma'am, do you believe in Jesus? Does your family believe in Jesus? And she says, yes, yes, we do believe. And he said, well, then we need to pray right now that the power that raised Lazarus from the dead would breathe life into your husband right now so that that young man out there does not grow up thinking this was his fault. So they prayed a mighty prayer, and as soon as they said, in Jesus' name, amen. In the other room where my dad was being worked on, the paramedics yelled out, we have a heartbeat. Praise God, right? <laughs> mm, praise God. We had six more weeks at the hospital with my dad. Everything we ever wanted to say was said. We held his hands. We sang over him. Andrew, of course, was the, the good guy, the one who had rescued Papa. After he, he died and was buried, when the memorial service was over, my mom said, well, I got to call that officer. Thank him. I've got his name and his badge number. So she put in the call to the local police department, and she was passed from one person to the next, and finally to the head of personnel. And he said, ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you, but well, we've never had a police officer by that name. And we've never assigned that badge number to anyone. All I know is Hebrews 13 tells us, be careful to entertain strangers, for in doing so, some of you have entertained angels without knowing it. Look for the miraculous. My dad had a favorite song. Have I Told You Lately That I Love You by Rod Stewart. Long before he ever died and long before he ever got sick, he said, whenever you hear this song, I want you to think of me. We even played it those six weeks in the ICU. We played it several times with some of his other hymns he loved. But then this song was the one that just spoke to him about how much he loved us. Have I told you lately that I love you? It's funny because he wasn't really a Rod Stewart guy. But that song really, really meant something to him. So we had those words engraved on his tombstone when he passed, have I told you lately that I love you. And then, you know, we began to hear that song at the strangest time. And I know that you know what I mean. Maybe for you it's that bird that lands on the fence or a cloud in a certain shape when you just know that you know that you know that God is saying to you, hey, I see you. I see what you're going through. I know what you're hurting. I know the loss. It's going to be okay. God is doing miraculous things around us. We heard that song at Austin's baseball playoffs. My dad wouldn't have missed the game. We get in the car afterwards. We turn the engine on, and we don't get to the edge of the parking lot. And Rod Stewart's Have I Told You Lately That I Love You comes on. One of our other sons said, Mom, I think you should turn it. It's too sad. I said, you know, I'm going to turn it up. 
I said, I don't get it, but I'll take it. God has you in his heart. He loves you. He's doing miraculous things. We went to the Bahamas and we all were excited to be there together as a family. And we finally got into our room and we get up onto our balcony and we're looking around. We're so amazed. And down by the pool, the Bahamian band begins to play Rod Stewart's Have I Told You Lately That I Love You. And I was so glad. I looked around and I said, you hear this, right? I said, I need witnesses. I mean, I make things up for a living. <laughs> so then we go to New York. I've got a big meeting. My publisher's super excited about my books. And it's kind of the, the pinnacle of a career when you're an author to be in New York City, to be at the Simon & Schuster building on Avenue of the Americas. It was just incredible. And we were talking about the books and they were so excited. And at the end of the meeting, the CEO, she said, you know, Karen, you ought to um, go down to Highline Park. I don't know what you were going to do today, but you and your family would love Highline. It's beautiful. It's a railroad track that's kind of built above the city with a garden on it. You can walk. It's pretty. So as I'm leaving, there's a security guard, and he is there guarding kind of the lobby. And in the lobby, there are all these glass cases with my book, and it's kind of like the cover, my face, the cover, my face. So it's a lot of my face in the lobby. And the security guard sees me and he kind of looks and he, he kind of goes like this and he says, hey, that's you. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, it is. And he said, well, look at that. You made it. And I said, thank you. And as I walked out and got in the cab with Kelsey and Kyle who were in New York with me, all I could think was, I want to call heaven. I miss my dad. He saw this. He believed this moment would happen. But you know, it's New York City. I'm not going to hear that song. I mean, it is what it is. So we drove down to High Line, and one thing or another, we get to the top. We're, we're taking pictures. Now, we actually had a camera with us, which for you younger people, that um, it took pictures, but you couldn't text or anything on it. So, and it was really hard to take a selfie, but we were trying to get a good selfie of us. When, when this gentleman walked by, and he said, well, I'll take that picture for you. And so Kelsey showed him how to use the camera, and then he looked at it after he took the picture, and he said, that is really lovely. And so he handed it back to us, and as he walked off, Kelsey said, Mom, do you know who that was? I said, N no, a hipster guy, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> she said, Mom, that was Rod Stewart. <laughs> I said, no. And she said, yes. I was showing him how to use the camera, and he said, I'm usually on the other side of this thing. But this will be fun. So now, not wanting to look entirely crazy, I began to run after the man. <laughs> sir, sir. And so he stopped, and he looked back. I said, sir, you just took our picture. And I'm catching up to him, and I think he thought I was having an episode of some kind. And <laughs> put his hand on my arm, and I put my hand on his, and he said, are you okay? And I said, I am, but are you Rod Stewart? And he said, well, yeah, yes, I am, I, I am. I'm here in town for my book tour. No, I didn't tell him I was an author. I said, can I tell you about my dad? So I told Rod Stewart about my dad and about how, have I told you lately that I love you was engraved on my dad's tombstone. Rod Stewart puts his hands together. He says, I can only tell you, you will never know what that meant to me. And then he says, can I give you a hug? So, <laughs> again, glad that I had witnesses. Because these, I, what are the, the odds that you go with someone to New York City, go to different spots, wander around your whole life, you may not run into each other. And yet here I am on a day I'm missing my dad and Rod Stewart is giving me a hug. It, it, there's no logic. A year later, he was on the Today Show. We were talking about this story and he came on the Today Show to say, it was me, I remember it, and now I'm reading your books. Only, only God. Look for the miraculous. But finally, the most important, if you want to write a bestseller with the days of your life, live for Jesus Christ. Now, Liberty students, 
Yes, amen. See, you are the best of the best. This is where you should go. If you're here for CFAL, I'll just help you. This is where you should go. <laughs> but even at a school like Liberty, even for me, we can get a little lazy. We can get complacent, and we have to remember that our faith is not an Instagram post, okay? <laughs> Living for Christ is life. It's everything. It's living above the world. It's not friendship with the world. It's not cussing. It's honoring your girlfriend. It's living pure. We can do that. Live for Jesus Christ. Now, I am going to close today by reading a story that I wrote for my kids, and I'm particularly wanting to do this because you see, Fa parents, I know what it feels like. I remember the year that Austin, our youngest, came here. The summer that that was about to happen, all with every heartbeat I would hear, August 24th, August 24th. I felt like I was turning in my resignation on August 24th, the day he was going to leave. Well, he's a junior now, so it goes by quickly. But so does life. So I'm going to read this. I'm going to ask you at the end of this, sometime in the next couple hours, either give your parents a hug or give them a call. All right. Long ago, you came to me, a miracle of firsts. First smiles and teeth and baby steps, a sunbeam on the burst. But one day you will move away and leave to me your past, and I will be left thinking of a lifetime of your lasts. The last time that I held a bottle to your baby lips. The last time that I lifted you and held you on my hip. The last night when you woke up crying, needing to be walked. When last you crawled up with your blanket, wanting to be rocked. The last time when you ran to me, still small enough to hold. The last time that you said you'd marry me when you grew old. Precious simple moments and bright flashes from your past. Would I have held on longer if I'd known they were your last? Our last adventure to the park, your final midday nap. The last time when you wore your favorite faded baseball cap. Your last few hours of kindergarten, last days of first grade. Your last at bat in little league, last colored picture made. I never said goodbye to all your yesterdays long past. So what about tomorrow? Will I recognize your lasts? The last time that you catch a frog in that old backyard pond. The last time that you run barefoot across our fresh cut lawn. Silly, scattered images will represent your past. I keep on taking pictures, never quite sure of your lasts. The last time that I comb your hair or stop a pillow fight. The last time that I pray with you and tuck you in at night. The last time when we cuddle with a book, just me and you. The last time you jump in our bed and sleep between us two. Last piano lesson, last vacation to the lake. Your last few weeks of middle school, last soccer goal you make. I look ahead and dream of days that haven't come to pass. But as I do, I sometimes miss today's sweet, precious lasts. 
the last time that I help you with a math or spelling test, the last time when I shout that, yes, your room is still a mess, the last time that you need me for a ride from here to there, the last time that you spend the night with your old tattered bear. My life keeps moving faster, stealing precious days that pass. I want to hold on longer, want to recognize your lasts. The last time that you need me, my help with details of a dance. The last time that you ask me for advice about romance. The last time that you talk to me about your hopes and dreams. The last time that you wear a jersey for your high school team. I've watched you grow and barely noticed seasons as they pass. If I could freeze the hands of time, I'd hold on to your lasts. For come some bright fall morning, you'll be going far away. College life will beckon in a brilliant sort of way. One last hug, one last goodbye, one quick and hurried kiss. One last time to understand just how much you'll be missed. I'll watch you leave and think how fast our time together passed. So let me hold on longer, God, to every precious last. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father God, we thank you for this time that we could just stop and listen to your voice. That you would help us, Lord, to write a bestseller with the days of our life. That you would help us, Lord, to love well and to laugh often. To look for the miraculous, but most of all, to live for Jesus Christ. Would you be with the Sifa families here who have such a big decision ahead and would you give them clarity? And would you help us, Lord, to hold on to every precious last? Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you.